Brother, can we trust Tao Chan? He has our elder brother at his beck and call, Zhang Fei said to Guan Yu. Governor Chan understands the symptoms of corruption well. He saw it in Minister Wang and in General Cao. Elder brother is no different to a doctor's knife. Without one, the other has no use. I've a use for a knife without a doctor. <laughs> ah, then you have become the doctor too, brother, Guan Yu said with a smile. Zhang Fei couldn't help but laugh. Ahead of them, Liu Bei called the marching column to a halt. At his side, Mi Ju pointed out at a village flanked by a sprawling forest, gleaming white under thick snow. This is the village Lord Chan spoke of, he reported. I see. Yet I fear our enterprise here is folly. Who am I to disturb the people with claims to office? There is no one else who should dare, but for you it is the opposite. Daring not to fulfill your responsibility is the offence, Mi Ju explained. Liu Bei nodded, and the march soon continued. Tao Chan had tasked Liu Bei with gathering men and monies from the coastal territories of Qingzhou. Only with such support could the governor hope to stand against the aggression of rogue general Cao Cao, and only with the reputation and lineage of Liu Bei could this support be given without becoming a rogue also. About a mile outside the village, Liu Bei came across a man on his knees in the middle of the road, sinking into the snow. To his flank were a set of tents, weapons on display on the racks outside. General Liu, long have I heard of your noble name and dreamed of meeting you. Finally heaven blesses me with this opportunity, the man said, his voice shaken by the cold. Liu Bei greeted him and followed him inside one of the tents, Guan Yu and Zhang Fei following closely with weapons in hand. They drank some warm wine and soon got to business. Governor Tao Chen advised me that you have committed a heinous crime against the Empire, Liu Bei said. The man, the local county prefect, went even whiter in the face than he had been before. I assure you that there must be some mistake, he spluttered out. No mistake here, weasel. You're in league with Wang Yun. You pledged your support to the traitor Dong, Zhang Fei said. That's not true. Dong Zhou sent troops to strong arm as mere prefects all over the commandery. If it was troops, then why did you not fight them? Guan Yu asked. It would have been impossible, sir. I did not ask what you thought the result would be. My apologies. I admit, perhaps there was more I could have done to disrupt the traitor's encroachments, but I was too feared. Until recently, I had held great shame for this failure. What do you mean, until recently? Liu Bei asked. I have said too much, forgive me. The official stood and begged his leave, but Liu Bei insisted he stay. Eventually, he was convinced to continue his point. I speak only of what happened to Minister Wang. Now it was Liu Bei's face going white, while Zhang Fei and Guan Yu glanced at each other in confusion. It is true that as a man of no military note, I could only act against the traitor by first helping him to win my chance. But how could I know if that was heaven's will? The fate of Wang Yun shows that I was correct to await a hero with heaven's favour instead. Zhang Fei and Guan Yu had some questions about what was being implied, but Liu Bei bid them remain silent and quickly concluded the meeting. It was agreed that this prefect would direct his revenues according to Tao Chan's plan from now on. The army continued up the coast. Word had gotten out that Liu Bei was demanding submission of the local officials, and as a result, they were all rushing to meet him on the road with horses, provisions and troops. Further from Lang Ye, there was no more talk of Wang Yun's alleged conspiracy. These officials were merely doing what they had learned was best when Dong Zhuo took power. If a warlord comes with an army, you bruise your forehead on the road before him and say whatever need be said. Liu Bei was a little different though. He helped you up and offered you a smile before he made his demands. He also claimed to be restoring the old order of the Han, but so had Dong Zhou's adjutants two years prior. By the coming of spring, Liu Bei had Langye Commandery under his control. By midsummer, Dong Lai Commandery joined them, now giving the imperial kinsman a de facto domain large enough to make him a governor in his own right. The people were cautious, feeling like they were being led away from the embrace of the emperor, 
but Liu Bei ensured that all were set to order in Langya and Donglai. Within weeks, the corrupt officials that plagued the empire were replaced with men hand-picked by Liu Bei himself. Calls to reduce their powers were deemed tyrannical in their own way. Such were decisions for the emperor to make, not a mere general, nor even a second marquis. This latter rank was bestowed upon Liu Bei by none other than Dong Zhuo himself. The message reminded him that the revenues of Langya and Dong Lai were still owed to the capital, just as it had always been. Liu Bei took the seal of the Marquis and returned the rest of the accompanying gifts with a pledge to serve the Emperor, not the Prime Minister Dong. At the end of summer, Liu Bei was taking his army back to Shu province, escorting a train of supplies, monies and weapons for Tao Qian's stand against Cao Cao. Before he arrived, a band of horsemen rushed up and urgently summoned him to Donghai. Tao Chen had fallen ill, and it was said he had not long left. Liu Bei and his brothers rode day and night to reach the city, but arrived to find the flags of mourning arrayed on the gatehouse. Liu Bei was moved to tears, saying, Though the emperor is young, without men like Tao Chen, he will never live to see the empire restored. My uncaring conduct is to blame. While his brothers consoled him, the gates opened and a large group of Tao Chen's court officials came out to welcome Liu Bei. They were eager to speak with him, but Liu Bei waved them all away and retired to the guest house. He refused to come out for several days, and when he finally answered the summons to attend court, he told them, When a loyal man dies, it is to house Liu like losing an arm. Even the single thread that connects me to the Son of Heaven is enough to show me what our Emperor must feel. How can we carry on with our daily business when heaven itself shrinks for the loss of Tao Chen? At this, some of the officials began to tear up also. Many of them were speaking with hands over their mouths to each other, pulling on each other's robes and quietly begging each other of something. It was just as Liu Bei had secretly hoped during his last couple of nights in the guest house. Guan Yu nodded to him, seeing the proceedings also. In the light of Liu Bei's imperial performance, some conclusion was arrived at among the officials, and then Mi Ju, who was overseeing the court as regent, brought out a bolt of white silk bearing a carefully painted message. Marquis Liu, this is the will of Lord Tao Chen, he said. He had desperately wanted to see you before he passed, but was contented to give you this charge should he not have the fortune. With the empire in chaos, there is no chance for a new governor to be appointed. Given the service you have already rendered to the Empire, and given your imperial blood, Lord Tao Chen begs that you will take up this heavy responsibility and lead Shu province against the traitors Dong and Cao alike. Liu Bei, looking astounded, accepted the charge at only modest insistence. Mi Ju offered up his seat, and without ado, Liu Bei was lifted from Marquis to provincial governor a rank held only by a handful of men across the land. Before him, the officials bowed down. Zhang Fei and Guan Yu did also, but Liu Bei waved his brothers up. With the help of all of you, Liu Bei said, we are certain to bring justice upon the villains of the land. I will pledge to work tirelessly in the Emperor's name so that the people can return to their lives in peace. Thus, Liu Bei joined the long list of warlords who had pledged the same across the country. And like them, his first act was to mobilize the army against a rival. Tao Cao, who had taken governorship of a province in a fashion similar to Liu, was planning to conquer Shu. Liu Bei was determined to strike first. Returning people to their peaceful lives was the end point of his plan, it can be assumed. For now, he marched over 2,000 men to attack Chen Commandery, the region Tao Chen had been contesting with Cao for the better part of a year. Cao had 2,000 men also here, but they had no one to match the ferocity of Zhang Fei, the fortitude of Guan Yu, or the determination of Liu Bei. When the two sides met, there was no negotiation. Liu Bei directed his archers to pierce the ranks of the halberdiers under Cao's banners. Where it was not fatal, the whistling and thudding of arrows threw the victims into confusion. Some charged forwards to take revenge on the archers, but Liu's own men charged too to begin a brutal melee. Without direction, the Cao army was split and crushed from all sides by attacks led by Guan Yu and Zhang Fei. Look, brothers, 
Zhang Fei said, holding up a captured banner. It read, those who expel the bandits. They were carrying this without any shame. I say we take it for ourselves. Indeed, Guan Yu agreed. Tao Tao is no better than a bandit, using this chaos to rob loyal men like Tao Chan and further his own ambitions. What do you think his ambition could be? Liu Bei asked. That's obvious. He wishes to follow the example of the traitor Dong, Zhang Fei answered. Brother, do not have second thoughts. Cao Cao may be an official of the Empire, but a bandit who steals a book is not a scholar. We remove corrupt men from the Han, no matter how low or how high, from robber to tyrant. That is how the chaos is stilled. Reassured, Liu Bei concluded the rounding up of survivors and sent messages to the various nearby counties to denounce the governor Zhao. Most returned replies at once, offering themselves to Liu's superior claim and virtue, but one message was returned in a different fashion. A company of armoured riders carrying Han banners arrived at Liu Bei's camp. It was none other than Cao Cao himself. Do you remember the day we defeated Zhang Zhe? Cao Cao asked once the formalities were concluded and wine was served. How could I forget? The rebellion was ended that day. It was the happiest day of my life, Liu Bei said. For me also. It was a great dishonour that you did not receive proper recognition for your service. Such was the blindness of the palace. I see now that heaven has favoured you where men did not. Cao Cao gestured towards the Those Who Expel Bandits banner draped over a stand in the corner of Liu Bei's tent. That is an award given to servants of the Han court. You have served them before, but you do not now. Please do not feel any resentment about the banner, Liu Bei said snidely. And yet I did expel bandits. If the Han court disagrees, does that change the course of history? <laughs> a funny thing to suggest. You suggested it? No, the Han court itself suggests it. After all, are you not the Han court here today? That is why you have come to my home to kill my people, is it not? Do not insult the imperial governor, Guan Yu demanded from behind Liu Bei. Cao Cao held up his hands and apologized. I mean no insult, just as a magistrate must state the record of a defendant from a neutral perspective. I ask you, Governor Liu, to tell me why you are here. Cao Cao, you have been openly using the confusion among the Imperial House to pursue your own goals without punishment. You stole Yan Province, and you would have Shu Province too. You distinguished yourself against the rebels, but then sullied any virtues you might have by turning to rebellion yourself. That is why I can no longer permit you to brandish stolen titles or speak for the Han. Cao Cao looked from Liu Bei to Zhang Fei to Guan Yu, meeting the stern expression from each. Then he burst out laughing. Amid the laughter he stood and walked away from the table. Liu Bei was about to motion for the guards to block him, but Cao stopped and picked up a bronze mirror. He returned it to the table and set it in front of himself. His laughter ceased and he turned it to face Liu Bei. Say it again, Governor Liu. Speak the words you more than anyone must hear, Cao Cao said. Enough of this, Zhang Fei blurted out. He moved to seize Cao Cao, but Liu Bei and Guan Yu held him back. If you're not going to talk, then this is a waste of our time, Liu Bei said. A waste? No, not at all. This meeting has made me realize something. When it was the Han who brought the land to ruin, and others who were seeking to repair it, is it not true that to say you fight for the Han is just as much poison to the ears of the people as to say you are a mere bandit? <laughs> yes, you've pointed that out to me most clearly. It gives me a rather good idea. Go, General Cao, and fetch your army, Li Bei said. Governor Cao, <laughs> but yes, you are right, that is a rank of the Han, so why sully myself with it? <laughs> Wait right here, and we shall decide this as mere generals. I'll speak for the Han no more in the meantime. Please take pleasure in that, if you will. With these facetious remarks, Cao took his leave and returned south with his cavalry guards. The brothers were left fuming in their tent. The traitor Cao takes the empire for a jest. He is more dangerous than Huang Shao, I am certain of it, Guan Yu said. The corruption takes many forms, Liu Bei said. 
Even those who seem loyal will grasp at any chances for power and lose their mind. We'll have to be careful to root out such people, lest the hand not merely fall, but the Empire cease to be and heaven crashes to earth. Don't worry, elder brother, Zhang Fei said. Once we're on the battlefield, his idiocy will be ended by honest steel, and that'll be the end of it. Liu Bei was reinforced by Tao Chen's troops from around Chen, and together they marched south to meet Cao Cao in battle. Scouts reported that an army had been seen moving towards them. There was no mistaking that it was Cao Cao, for this force did not have Han banners, but newly made Cao ones. Cao Cao would speak for the Han no more. The leading banner gave Cao's rank as the general who reforms mankind. The army he led was filled with veteran troops, freshly supplied from Yanzhou. Liu's men had marched season after season carrying out Tao Chan's plan and were said to be whispering among themselves in the evenings. Liu Bei puzzled over what to do about the impending battle, until suddenly a man presented himself in the command tent. It was Chuo Xuan, Tao Chan's lead strategist, and now, begrudgingly, Liu Bei's lead strategist. Governor Liu, he said, I have devised a way to win this battle without effort and secure the future of Shu province. Please allow me to explain. What was Chu Xuan suggesting? Read on. <laughs>